Okay, so welcome everyone to the live uh, question and answer for the keynote speaker and for session one. I'll start with the questions for uh, Alina, um, seeing as you are our keynote speaker. A fascinating and very significant paper, thank you. Can you detail how the ethical issues are managed in your excellent facility? Yes, uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's quite a long, it's it's very strict. Um, um, it's in, in Australia or, or in um, yeah, the, the whole ethics. Um, so the whole, um, everything, the, the whole facility is led by um, the University of Technology, Sydney, and they, um, they have different partners. So AFTER has different partners and UOW is a partner of that. So all those partner organizations, they um, have a representative who sits in the ethics committee. Um, so um, when someone wants to do a project, they have to... Um, discuss the projects within the, the partner organization. Um, so uh, first of all, it has to go through, uh, through, through discussion there. And then via the representative, they are presented to the, et the, the ethics committee at UTS. And then um, the ethics committee sits together um, and makes decision. Um, if, if there's a yes, you as a researcher, you come on the waiting list to get a donor, um, but very often, and they're very strict about it, there's a no. Um, why? Because um, they, um, it's not like in the US, um, I know one, one TAF facility um, was closed in the US because of um, abuse. So um, in, in Australia or in the UTS, they're very strict, um, very respectful to the donors. Um, um, they, yeah, they follow it, it's it's it related to all laws and policies and um for example we can't do stab wounds we can't use explosions uh, we can't do gunshot wounds i had a couple of projects who were um denied lots of people actually so um um and th those are simple things i asked to um extract some teeth of donors to do a, a, a separate teeth experiment and that was not allowed because we would um actually um, um yeah cut into the donor. So um, it's very strict and very respectful, but it, it goes through a whole long uh, process. Um, so yes, for Lauren, were you able to measure how high the light went um, in the cave through the blender program? This might help answer the question of whether the lamps were placed on the ground or being handheld, for example. Not the flame height itself, but the reach of the light was extrapolated. So in the blender scenes, the camera view is six meters away. So you can see that the light can reach quite a distance um, depending on which combination of materials is used. Uh, even when it was placed on the ground, um, the lamps could have been handheld for navigation, um, but the assumption is that they would have been placed on the ground or in a nook um, for working and viewing. Um, and the image that was placed on the cave wall um, is about one and a half meters high. So, you can see that the light can reach quite high and that would have been increased with more lamps that you add. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda, we have a question um, for you actually. Uh, do you see a difference in approach to experimental archeology span between uh, those students coming from a more, shall we say, academically focused uh, background and those from a more practically focused background? That is a really interesting question. And I think they each bring something to it. It's almost as though most people arriving have 50% of what they need, and then they have to work on the other 50%, the hardest. Um, but the people who come with a lot of skill sets, some of them are just able to translate that into many other multiple craft areas, for example, simply because they're very adept. They have good hand-eye coordination, dexterity, or they have a lot of insights, or they're, they're people who learn by doing. Um, some of the people who come academically, they struggle a little bit more with the doing, but on the other hand, they, they usually persevere and it's the insights as much as the actual achievement um, in whatever it is that they're physically interested in that is really the measure of, of how well they do. And, and the academic people, oh boy, they know their stuff. Um, but it's the mixture and you put them all together in the classroom and then they cross over all of those different ideas and blends and it becomes very exciting to, to see happen in front of you. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question here for Johnny. What would have been the purpose for Odyssey to carry cold charcoal? Would this simply have been used to make a very small task specific glowing fire around the tree line 
or to act as a reliable base for a larger fire when fuel was available? And also how much charcoal could these containers accommodate? Right, that, the answers to that question, which comes in three parts is uh, yes, yes, and approximately 0.5 kilograms of charcoal. So the, uh, definitely the, uh, the, ch the, the charcoal carry would have been used for uh, small fires. It would also have been used for creating, uh, for making uh, the base of a small fire, which would then be manipulated to be uh, to be larger, or for more specific tasks. Um, and for uh, the sort of specific tasks we can look at, then it's worth referring to Alex Pryor's uh, talk, which I think was the one straight after mine. Um, and the, uh, uh, the the amount of charcoal uh, we've already got the dimensions of the pot uh, of the container, but if you wanted it in exact kilograms, you'd have to have a look at the size of charcoal particles. If you had lots of small charcoal particles, you get more in, and the uh, the mass would then go up. Uh, you'd also have to have a look at the density as well. Um, but you're not looking at it being a um, at your sole fuel. You're looking at it being the start of the fire. So you start it using the uh, the iron pyrites, and then you get a, a, a spark to land on the iron on the uh, bonus voluntarius, the horse heat fungus. You then blow that one so that it was a glowing ember. Touch the charcoal to it. Blow the two together. The charcoal then lights. You then extinguish the uh, the bonus momentarius, and you just continue to blow on the uh, on the charcoal until that's that's glowing like a barbecue coal. Uh, and then you can add to that um, any uh, tinder or fuel uh, that you um, you could uh, carry with you, if indeed any was carried. And um, yeah, so you, you you could still cook over that sort of that charcoal. In the same way as you would a barbecue with you if you had answer the question. Okay, we have another question here uh, from uh, for Julia. Um, they're interested in finding out if the cloth uh, with the tog insertion would make a good sleeping blanket. Tog side down would trap air and keep you warm. Um, they are a weaver, so uh, would like to make a blanket and a mattress cover in this fabric. So we're wondering if you had uh, any insight as to this. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so sleeping blankets was one of the. Um, one of the most common suggestions that I got during the survey that I did actually, um, and I think it's a really, really interesting idea, especially um, because the evidence that we have of people wearing them is for um, the little evidence that we do have, um, suggests they might have been used on maybe long journeys or long boat journeys and things, at which point you can think that people might definitely be using them as more than just clothing, that they might be using them as bedding in the nighttime. Um, so I think, yeah, that's definitely a really, really interesting idea. And um, I know I would certainly love to make a full size one and try that out and see how that would work. Um, and, and with regards to the um, the pile trapping air, if you wore it um, tog side down, I think they suggested. Um, you see, yeah, so I did actually try out some of the different, um, during my insulation experiments, I tried it with the pile facing inwards and the pile facing outwards. I guess that's not quite directly translating into using it flat because that was using it where it was actually enclosing the thermometer. So it was a slightly different situation, but um, I, there was definitely some difference in, um, the, the insulation results that you got with the pile facing in and facing outwards. I think with the thicker pile, it tended to be better for insulation when the pile was facing inwards. So maybe towards the body, I guess, if you were using it as a blanket. So yeah, I think there would be definitely, you might notice a difference if you were using it um, in different ways. So I think that's something that would be really, really interesting to try out in the future. Um, and the other, the other thing that I noticed with that was that um, when the samples were wet, they actually um, insulated better when the pile was facing outwards, which I thought was really interesting because um, with the pile facing outwards, it also makes the water run off it better. So I thought that was a really interesting dimension. Um, so I was really glad that I did try it with um, different different ways of wearing it and different ways of using it. So yeah, I, I would love to make a, a full size one or several full size ones and try them out in different ways. So I'd love to hear how, how, how they get on if, if you do end up doing that. So thank you. Could I just jump in there for a second, please? This please is Tom do. Bosmer. Um, yeah, uh, Julia, that was a really interesting talk. And it reminded me of something I read decades ago in Tim Severin's book about 
uh, well, called the Brendan voyage about his trip in a leather boat across the Atlantic. Uh, talk about experimental archaeology. Um, but he said they had a, a, a man from a Trondor Patterson from the Faroe Islands on board with deep Viking heritage, obviously. And he said that um, they should soak their woolen gloves in seawater because the insulation was better then. And I thought, wow, that's counterintuitive, but it, it harks back to what you just said about wet pile, etc. cetera. And um, I just, I'll have to look up that, um, that reference again, because I might be um, wrong about it, but it, that's what I recall. It was very fascinating. Anyway, thank you for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I respond to that? Is that right? Please do, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. Thank you, yeah. Um, so one of the things that I'd really like to explore in the future is um, is about the ways in which the pile gets wet, if that makes sense, because obviously the difference between what I did in the project a lot, which was soaking the pile, the samples, in a bucket of water and then trying them out. But that's not necessarily going to produce the same results as if it was being sort of slowly soaked over a period of time, maybe if you were standing in a boat or something. So I think, yeah, that, that's really, really interesting. And I really, um, yeah, I'd be really interested to see how how that, um, the sort of different ways of applying water would affect the insulation and the sort of functionality of them over time. So that's really interesting. Thank you. We actually uh, have a follow-up question um, to that. I'm not sure if you did just uh, answer this, but uh, so um, from someone else, uh, I'm presently collecting the outer guard, the tog hairs from uh, Icelandic fleeces. For your fabric, did you use the undercoat for the fabric or was it blended? Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I so I used commercial Icelandic yarn so for the main fabric. So I believe that is blended. Um, I think it feels blended to me. It feels like um, I don't think it was would be fine enough to be just the undercoat. Um, I I haven't looked as much as I would like to into the um, the fibre sort of composition of the textiles from the period, and in particular the Hainas fragments, which I believe haven't been analysed since the nineteen sixties. So it would be really interesting to look at those and um, see what kind of um, yeah what part of the fleece those were made of because that's a really interesting, there's some really interesting possibilities there surrounding um, whether the outer coat would be used for the pile and then the undercoat would be used for the fabric. That's a really, really interesting idea because obviously it changes our ideas of how those materials were using the resources that people had and how those might represent, you know, that kind of use of resources. So I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. But unfortunately um, for this project, I did just use commercial Icelandic yarn. Uh, which I believe was blended. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we actually, I see Alina has just asked a question. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself, uh, Alina. Yes, I can. Um, hi, Tom. Thanks. It was a very impressive, uh, impressive experiment that you did there and so many people involved. So I wanted to know, was the boat plank at Wadi Gawasi the only part preserved of the whole boat? And then maybe, um, I don't know much about boats, I'm afraid. Um, is there a lot, are there a lot of ancient Egyptian boats that you recover uh, in, um, in, in that part of the world in archaeology? No, in, in Egypt, there are, yeah, there are a number of ancient boats recorded, quite a lot, actually. Um, so I hope that answers the last question you had. Well, at Wadigawasis, um, there were lots of planks. Um, there was a rudder, um, a quarter rudder. The other information came from mainly other excavations of, of similar types of boats or similar construction, um, frame, generally frameless um, boats with just heavy planking and, and through beams to hold them together. And that's, that's about it. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does, thanks. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, we have another question here for Alexander. Uh, you mentioned, uh, doing your experiments in less than ideal conditions, is this something that is regularly done in other experiments of this kind? Or would you say this is a relatively novel approach? Um, I guess the ones that the, the experiments that I'm aware of have done things like made sure that all their fuel that they were using was very dry. The ambient conditions tend to have been during the summertime in, in nice ambient weather and so on. 
Now, as, as it was, um, we actually had a pretty nice day for it this time, which was purely by luck. Uh, the nighttime temperatures didn't fall as low as we thought they might do. The humidity did go to pretty much 100%, um, and all our fuel was wet. So we did have to um, adjust our, our fire management strategies for that reason. Um, but uh, I, I, it was just something that we wanted to build into the experiment from it, it kind of have it at its center point is it trying to replicate something which is more real life like rather than something where you've 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 kind of given yourself a head start as it were um yeah and, and that's just something that we wanted to do i suppose yeah i, I don't have much to say on that i'm afraid <laughs> no no worries i think that answers uh, the question um okay we're going to have a look uh we have another question here for aline um, you talked about the in interest regarding living above smelly uh, cadavers, smelly humans. Um, did you, uh, you did some experiments with pigs as well. Um, would you say there's a marked difference between the smells of decomposing humans and the smells of decomposing animals, or would it be uh, similar in that respect? No, there's certainly a difference. Um, we use pigs because in, in many um, uh, situations, there, there are no other options, but a pigs smell worse, as you can, yeah, sm smell worse than humans, or, or maybe different. Um, I think the, <laughs> but this is a subjective answer, it's not scientifically proven, but um, um, the pig smell is, even, is more intense and it just sticks on you um, even more than um, a human uh, smell of decomposition. Actually, just you mentioned, um, of course, the sort of subjectivity of, of smell in that respect. Um, but you mentioned that this is something you're interested in pursuing further. How will you do that in a from a scientific perspective? Or are you planning to do it more from an experiential side of things? Well, we, we are doing it at the moment, and it is with um, uh, forensic chemistry of uh, UTS. So they, um, they are specialized in odor analysis, and they catch VOCs, that's volatile organic compounds, um, um, above the graves, and then they analyze the, the, the chemistry. So we have graves without human remains, uh, we have graves with human remains, with mummified remains, uh, with limed remains, uh, gypsum remains. So, and um, uh, we, we have a, a very good student at the moment, uh, Bridget, um, who is uh, doing those analyses. Okay, perfect. Look forward to hearing about them uh, in a future conference, hopefully. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of questions for Lauren. So um, does the program that you use also take into account, for example, wind or other environmental conditions? And uh, as a follow up to this, did you use any examples of different combinations of candle wicks? So with multiple candles? No, so in Blender, because it's open source and free to use, there wasn't an option to factor in the physics of wind and different environmental conditions. Um, but that's a very interesting question and something I hopefully I'd like to take into consideration in the future. Um, so we were only able to program the light properties. Um, there is another program which I think can incorporate those aspects. I think it's called Radiance. Um, so that could be something to look into. And can you, what was the second question, please? The second one was about using multiple candles um, with perhaps different wicks um, for the different candles, uh, whether that was something that you could incorporate. So rather than just having a single candle um, and seeing what that wick did, seeing whether wicks made of different materials or combined together um, would cause a different uh, result. Yes, I think it would cause a different result. And um, we didn't use multiple wicks, or multiple candles in one experiment um, because we wanted to measure the light output from just one. But the assumption is that multiple candles would have been placed around in a scene and that would, of course, increase the amount of light um, but that is something I would like to look into as well to see, you know, what is the maximum amount of light we can get. And even if we had multiple wicks in the same lamp, that would definitely, I think that would definitely produce a much brighter result. Uh, we have some more questions for you. Uh, is there any evidence for a mix of pork or beef fat? And would there be any merit for testing that? Yes. Yeah, so the reason I used uh, beef and pork was as a modern equivalent. So in the 80s, the bone did lipid analysis on some of the lamps found at Lascaux Cave um, and found evidence from like oryx and hogs um, being used as the fat fuel. Um, so I've used beef and pork as the, you know, the nearest fat 
but there could definitely be room to look at different types of fat more than that. One more question uh, for you. I'd love to know which species of moss was used and if the birch polypore was treated in any way before use rather than simply cutting it to size. Oh, the birch polypore, no, it wasn't treated. It was just dried um, and then we cut it up. Um, but the moss, I'm going to have to look into that and get back to you because I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Always leave them wanting more. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> way. <laughs> um, we have a question here for Johnny. Um, what are the overall implications of your results, would you say? So what would be the difference between carrying your own fire versus making it yourself in terms of the practical consideration? This needs to be put into context. Uh, when you're dealing with Ertzi, uh, he was he was being hunted, uh, as as you can tell by the fact that he's got uh, the, the remains of an arrow in the, in the back of his shoulder. Um, he was also navigating, he was above the tree line, he was a very poorly chap uh, with a, a number of different ailments. He was um, really sort of struggling in life. He was also injured, uh, as you can tell, by the uh, defensive wounds on his hands. So trying to carry fire and curate fire is um, a bit of a non-starter for him, really. It would have been a lot easier uh bearing in mind that he was proficient in his fire lighting as you can uh, tell by having a look at his fire lighting equipment in the south tyrol museum of archaeology you can um, can have a look at the the fomus fomentarius and it, it, there's there are microscopic uh traces of the iron pyrites there so he was he was using it as as a fire lighting tool um so if you can light your fire uh then it means you don't need to carry it and if you because if you need to carry it you need to you need to continuously uh, and uh, f from from my experiments you need to continuously curate it so you're stopping every um, every 20 30 meters blow on a uh, on an ember just to keep it ticking over it, it's a really slow process to move through the landscape whilst carrying fire it's not uh, in in the ideal situation, you'd be on nice flat sort of playing field almost at sea level where there's plenty of oxygen. Uh, you start to get yourself up to um, up to altitude. Um, he was at, uh, at 3,210 meters. Uh, there's a, um, a distinct uh, drop off of the oxygen supply at that altitude. So that's gonna make life even more difficult. When you take that, that context, um, away and you start to sort of make it more of a, uh, a generic and, and general point then you'll find that the that when you're transporting fire unless you've got to go a short distance and you're going from uh, a uh, for, from your, your your initial camp to your next location which is let's say um, a kilometer away yeah that's doable um, but you have to start you have to start carrying all sorts of other equipment. It becomes an impractical proposition. Uh, so we have another question here for Alex. Um, how was your fire initially constructed? Pyramid, haphazard pile, etc. And how was it primarily fed? Um, the slow feed of long branches just thrown on top. And was any wood cut um, using an axe or was it just broken? So a couple of different questions for you there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yes, we the, the so, where possible sticks were broken by hand. Everything was done by hand, so we didn't use any tools of any kind to break wood. Um, so we only collected stuff which we could move around by hand, and things that couldn't be broken, we we then fed them into the fire slowly over a period of time. Um, that meant it was quite difficult. I, I couldn't develop a method for accurately measuring the fuel consumption per hour across the, the 24 hour period, because it, it, exactly this factor of feeding the logs in slowly over a period of time. Um, I mean, that's a fire management strategy, which I'm sure, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's just one of those things that you do when you when you light a fire, it's just difficult to measure. Um, uh, other than that, the, in terms of the, the design of the fire, it, it changed across the 24 hour window um, on firstly, just an ad hoc basis, uh, and secondly, according to any of the specific activities that we wanted to conduct. So um, when we were heating up 
or when we were warming the rocks originally, the rocks were just located around the outside edge of the fire, um, or then slowly moved in towards the center, and then the fire kind of expanded to, um, to, to, to mound up around the rocks, and at that point, it, it became a true pile. Um, other than that, it, it, was, it was just mostly no, no specific uh, fire arrangement strategy was in mind, I suppose, is the answer to that question. The only other specific thing that we did was create embers to cook on, uh, and that just involved clearing, clearing the, the larger bits of wood away so, so the embers were exposed so, so that we had that heat then. Uh, Julia, we've had some more questions coming through for you as well. Um, did you, I imagine not if you were using commercial yarn, but did, uh, did you leave the lanolin in the TOG? Um, she, the speaker suggests um, when you continue your investigation, will you try hand pinning your fiber? Um, so uh, in the grease, not the, the lanolin not washed out <laughs> um, for the ground cloth fabric. Um, this should be greatly up your water resistance um, as commercial yarn will have been washed to remove lanolin as well as any dirt. Um, and they suggest maybe uh, contacting a spinning guild um, to help with hand spinning, for example. Uh, I think as well, um, if, if uh, this person is a member of Exarch, I'm sure you're aware also, Julia, of the uh, uh, textile chats that we have so perhaps you might be able to find someone there but if you want to maybe just comment on on that i left the lanolin in the pile so the the um the the loose fleece tog which was the what i used for the pile still had the lanolin in it because i was a bit wary of washing it too much um before i wove it in because i was worried about felting it um so that did have some lanolin left in it and then yes as you say the um the ground fabric because it was a commercial yarn um had been washed um, and scoured extensively so that wouldn't have had any lanolin in it at all so yeah so it's definitely something that i would really like to try out in the future is to compare the effect of the lanolin so to have um maybe some samples that had um, lanolin in both the fabric and the pile and then some samples that didn't have any lanolin in either of them and absolutely um spinning them spinning the um thread for the ground fabric would be a really good way of doing that um it's something that i um I would love to do. I mean, I do spin and I would really like to do it. I just didn't have the time um, to do that for this project. But I do have a whole heap of um, the undercoat that I actually combed out of the, the pile for this project. So I would love to um, use that in the future for that project because it does still have all the lanolin in it. Um, so yeah, lovely and greasy should be great for that. Um, and absolutely that will have an effect, I think, on the um, water resistant qualities what effect it would have on the insulation properties i don't know and also i think that would affect the the sensory properties and what it feels like to use and to wear and what it smells like as well i think that will affect that um so it'd be really interesting to use that in those practical experiments but also in those kind of um sensory experiments and exploring the sort of materiality of it and how people respond to that because um yeah i think that would be a really interesting dimension to explore as well um yeah, I think, does that answer that question? Um, I've, I've slightly lost track of which questions I've answered. Now. I think so. No, I think that sounds good. Um, these are also, I think, follow-up questions from uh, from the earlier ones as well. Okay. Um, we also have another question for you while you're still on. Uh, you mentioned um, speed. Uh, so for the pile insertion, um, you mentioned speed, but did you find the looser pile easier to weave in than the more dense pile insertion? Right, so that's a really good question because I, I had some really interesting experiences with that. So one of the differences between the way that I inserted the pile from the denser one and the looser one was that the denser one, um, I was actually inserting it in a much more regular pattern because of the density that I was aiming for. So I was actually um, skipping a particular number of threads between each pile lock that I was inserting. Whereas the looser one, I was actually um, spreading them out a bit more, but they were also had to be slightly staggered to try and, um, so they didn't all end up sort of clumped in the same place just because of the size of the sample that I was working with and the um, how spread apart they needed to be. So I assumed going into it that the looser pile would be a lot quicker, but actually I found that the um, the amount of time that I spent trying to work out where to stagger the locks actually took quite a lot of time and actually made it more time consuming than a denser one, which obviously I spent more time just individually physically putting them in, but I didn't have to spend lots of time thinking about where I was going to put them. So actually I found the denser pile easier than the, um, than the less dense pile, because obviously there was that extra variable. Um, so I think if I was gonna do it with a bigger sample, I would have a lot more room to um, make it more consistent between the samples. So I get a better idea of whether um, putting more pile in would actually take more time if, if all those things were consistent. Does that answer the question? I think, um, 
Hopefully. I'm sure they'll say if not. <laughs> they, they seem very keen. Yes, um, yes, do get back to me. <laughs> um, uh, I actually had a, it was related to something that Julia mentioned in her talk, but I would like to ask a question of Linda, um, because Julia mentioned indeed that some of the results seem obvious, but had never been considered in sort of more academic literature or in an academic context, shall we say. Do you think this is something that should be focused on more in the future in experimental archaeology? So these kind of general assumptions or common knowledge, but uh, that haven't been, shall we say, experimentally proven. Um, is this something you're maybe planning to look into further or you think should be looked into further? That, that is such a generally applicable question. And one of the things that's really struck me about all of the conference abstracts I've seen, and certainly about every single person in this session, is that they're doing exactly that. They're challenging some of our preconceptions, assumptions. And I think, you know, Julia, with some quite well known to the textile and the Viking world, um, the set of a pile fabrics is doing that. And I think to Johnny with Utsi, I mean, Utsi is seen as a well-known um, set of archeological finds, world famous. And yet there's still something new that you can show about how we, we just don't understand everything, even when we think we do and we've made assumptions. And, and so I think everybody here is doing a grand job. And I think the conference as a whole and experimental archeology span as a whole, everybody tackles these huge sets of assumptions. And as you do the experiment, you're just really opening up all of those other questions and insights in realizing, yep, we haven't really sorted out this one. And so it just goes off like a kind of beautiful firework into the atmosphere, just echoing down. And there'll be people listening who will think, oh yeah, I could tackle this now. And, and that's just a fantastic way of seeing this whole subject. Thank you very much. Those are very nice words for, for a conference like this as well. Uh, we have another question here for Alex and perhaps for Johnny. Um, I'm interested in the amount of smoke that is produced from fires. If you're making fires indoors, is there a way you would ideally make your fire um, to avoid smoking yourself out? Uh, so yes, uh, if either of you would like to answer this or both of you. Um. Um, the only thing I would say is you want to keep it hot, really. Um, if it cools down, then it smokes a lot. But, but Johnny may have more to say on this than me. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> thanks, Alex. Um, th there are certain things that I would do. Uh, first of all, I would remove any bark. Uh, if you think about what smoke is, it's the, it's, it's the unburnt bits, really, which have become uh, uh, put into sort of aerosol form. Uh, so remove the bark, get the driest wood possible. Um, as Alex says, keep the temperature up uh, and that uh, increases the proportion of um, combusted material. If you can keep the temperature up um, using large fuel, then so much the better. But actually what you might need to do is you might need to combine your fuels so that you're using small fuels uh, as, as in sort of finger sized, uh, finger width, um, and mix that in with the larger fuel so that you've got that, that increased in temperature. But um, wood selection is absolutely key. The other thing, I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure what you mean by inside. If you're thinking about the inside, I mean, what, what, what I get is, is uh, in my mind, is things like the inside of the, uh, the Viking Longhouse at the Ancient Technology Centre. Um, if you're talking about somewhere like that, then keep, keep the drafts down as well, because as soon as you get a draft and you start to blow uh, any smoke that you've got, in a place that you don't want it. Whereas if you've got smoke going in only one place, then at least you can make good use of it. So from a practical point of view, uh, you can you can then start to sort of uh, keep down pests. You can start to smoke food. You can do uh, uh, other sort of smoking activities. So um, there are ways of doing it. The best way is to use charcoal because it doesn't have those impurities. So charcoal burns almost with no smoke. Um, I hope, hope that uh, answers the question in uh, in conjunction with, with Alex. Can I chip in here, Tilly? Please that do, okay? yes. Yeah. yeah, the issue with smoke is partly it's one of, do you have an effective placement of the fire and have the right kind of fuel so that it, it's going up and away if there is smoke. Um, but also it's actually, it's one of those things that it has benefits but it's also a problem. And so Utsi is one of those people who have sort of, you know, compromised lungs, but also a lot of fires 
in the open air museum reconstructed buildings, um, they have had issues with the fires. And so some people will only use kiln dried wood simply because it solves some of the smoke issues. But also each one of those buildings is in itself an experiment. And in parts of um, certainly Scandinavia and also I think Britain, they've done experiments in how smoke particles move around those kinds of buildings and just the levels of, if you like, bad products from the combustion effects of the fuels. And Yanni Marie Christensen has published an article in Exarch um, a while back now, five or six years ago perhaps, um, which has got some very interesting insights as to how fires move smoke around um, in different kinds of buildings and the effect of what might be happening to people's lungs. So I think the question of smoke is a really interesting one because it does have benefits, but it also has these issues of, of longer term health as well. I don't know if any of our speakers had any questions for any of the other speakers uh, while we have a moment. Putting you all on the spot here. <laughs> oh, uh, Alex, yeah. Hi, yeah, I've got a question for Lauren. I was just really fascinated by these experiments with the fat lamps. I was just wondering, did you gather any information, even just anecdotally, about the amount of heat which is generated by these, these lamps? Because uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this for, for heating the inside of dwellings, and I know that that is done in some places. Uh, so yeah, I just wondered if you had any comments about that based on your experiences. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, only anecdotally, um, but the or the fungi wicks definitely produced the most heat and the highest flames. Because um, I, you know, sat in a, room, a very dark room doing all of these. Um, I couldn't tell you any data about that, but the, the fungus definitely produced quite warm flames. Um, I assume that that's simply down to the rate of fat burning. If you burn more fat, then it's hotter. Is it, do you think it's that simple? Yeah, I think so. Um, the other question that I had for you uh, was about the production. How, how did you produce the fat to feed the lamps? So, Jimmy, how did I treat the the lard? Do you mean? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so you're just buying buying lard and then melted it out. Um, I, yeah, I was just thinking about the, the amount of effort that you have to go to to produce the this these fats um, if you're producing it on a on a, on a, a wood fire, um, doing it straight from the animal. Uh, because this is, it, 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 I think there's a whole economy here um, of um, how you're using fats and, and generating the, these fat lamps and fueling them, which I just think is really interesting to study from a fuel wood perspective and a fats perspective, um, and really the, the, the whole cycle. Yeah, that's really interesting. So the, the fats that I used were already very refined, but if you were using it straight from the animal, um, I guess it would be quite a process to filter out some of the you know the larger chunks of the fat um because that would impact the capillary action and uptake into the wick um so the fats that i used once it was melted were relatively smooth so that you could keep the the capillary action going and the flame quite consistent but it would definitely be more of a process to actually refine it straight from the animal uh, uh, did, did you have any sense of how much fat that you would consume per hour of of the lamps burning at all? Um, I'm not sure. We only ran the experiment for about 20 minutes, um, but there was still fuel left in all of the wick and fat combinations then. Um, but the lamps from Lasco had a capacity of around 10 to 30 milliliters. Um, so I'm, you know, based on anecdotally from those 20 minutes, I reckon they could run for a, a couple of hours. Maximum. That's really interesting. Yeah, okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, um, I see that uh, Aline has a question. Yeah, can I just jump in here? I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that um, at uh, the University of Bordeaux, we have a PhD student who just submitted her PhD or, or defended her PhD. And that was about, uh, she did quite similar experiments to the ones from Lauren. So you, you might be interested to look into that. Um, so it was about the Gravettian um, and she compared torches and lamps. Um, in Cusack cave, uh, the cave of Cusack, and then in an experimental cave. So I thought maybe Alex and Lauren um, um, might be interested in, interested in um, her research. Uh, her name is Armance Joutot. I can give you her details if you want. 
Oh, yes, yes that's very please. interesting. I'd love to speak to her. Okay, uh, we actually have a question for John. <laughs> I'm sorry it's taken so long. John Ertel, um, how would you see uh, the differences between how archaeological reconstruction is handled in Japan, so looking at museums, the scientific discourse, etc., compared to elsewhere in the world? Well, it's a, it's a difficult question, Mike. Um, I think the one difference that we see in Japan is that there's so much reconstruction going on um, that what happens is that things get built but then never get used. Um, so you have a lot of build it and forget it kind of things because there's money to build it, but there's no sort of incentive to continue to use it. Um, so that's, I think, the one main difference. Um, so when I was going throughout Europe, um, or mostly the UK, um, and looking at uh, places with reconstructed buildings, of course, you have um, people using them, you have uh, reenactors actually building them, um, and so forth. But in Japan, they're built by local construction firms. Um, they're closed off while they're building, and then they appear, and you never see anyone at them. So I think that's probably the main difference, is that they're built quite rapidly, quite frequently in Japan, but they're just not used in the same kind of way. Do you think that it might be possible, as in there might be uh, more of an influence, especially, I don't know, hopefully after a conference like this, if everyone's listening, um, of people, for example, using doing experiments that involve the use of this house? So we've already mentioned doing smoke, uh, fire and smoke experiments, for example. Do you think this yeah, is something that so will be improved? Um, there's a few trends that are actually trying to um, improve that. Um, so my database of reconstructed buildings in Japan has 360 sites, right? A uh, thousand buildings built. Um, and of the ones that I've been to, I think there's only two that have an active kind of um, experimental archaeology project dealing with the buildings themselves. Um, and so that kind of um, thing is starting, but it's still not mainstream. Um, I think in terms of where the it's going to begin to start happening is in the next few years as um, a lot of the buildings that were built during Japan's sort of bubble economy period in the 1990s are now sort of falling apart. And so the question of, well, what do we do with them now? Do we rebuild them? And if we rebuild them, what do we read? What's the point of rebuilding them for? Um, and so there, I think there's a lot of um, these kinds of questions coming up in Japan. Um, and so there will be a lot more experimental sort of based um, activities, possibly. But there's also another aspect of that where um, reconstructed buildings in Japan are built by bureaucratic institutions who receive money to do it, um, and they don't get any sort of um, real sort of um, incentive to do a kind of public outreach um, element to them. So it's a mixed bag of, of things going on in Japan. Okay, thank you very much. We have a, by the way, we do have a comment um, from someone from the Exarch community uh, talking about rendering lard, just uh, referring back to the earlier conversation. Um, they said that they didn't find it too difficult, but it's a lot of waiting and then strain. So I guess it depends how much time uh, you have. So we have uh, another question for Alex. Um, we just started coppicing our small ash grove this week. <laughs> what effect do you think using coppiced wood would have on fuel consumption, considering it would be more consistent in terms of size, fewer branches, etc.? That's a really interesting question. Um, I hadn't really thought about what happens if you're forced to use a standardized size of wood. Um, my, my, my gut feeling would be that um, you'd probably use more wood more fuel would uh, doing it that way because you don't have the option of using the smaller stuff when you'd rather do it that way you, you're stuck with the bigger stuff the whole time that would be my gut feeling um but uh, yeah that's an interesting one i have to think about that one some more thank you 